They try to make me go to rehab, I said, no, no, no. Yes, I've been black, but when I come back, yo, no, no, no. I ain't got the time, and if my daddy thinks I'm fine, they try to make me go to rehab. I won't go, go, go. Kia ora, my dear friends. So who wrote and performed that song? Pause the video and go drop a comment. And if you don't know, say I don't know, because actually this is really interesting for me because I know many of you in the Soul Food Fano are from the States. And although this artist eventually did extremely well in the States, you may not have heard about her. She wasn't Beyonce famous, right? So go ahead, pause the video, just humor me. Because <laughs> this is really interesting for me, right? Because she was a big star where I'm from, the UK, right? And specifically from London. Okay, so what guess did you make? I'm really curious. I'm going to read those comments and I'm gonna, we're going to have a good chuckle together because some of you may have guessed it right. Maybe all of you did. And if you all did, I'm really quite pleased because I do believe this artist deserves her legacy, right? Welcome, my loves, to Green Tea and Sanity. I really wanted to make this piece of content for you guys because there's a bit of time sensitivity to watching the documentary on Netflix right now. And it's called Amy. The song I sung was by the artist Amy Winehouse. And she was a bright star that burnt out very young. And in this video, trigger warning here, I'm going to be touching on some of the themes that were relevant to her life. Obviously, namely themes around addiction, and really following on from our previous corridor around, you know, parents and how they shape us. If that sounds like your cup of tea today, then I'm so happy because, you know, this is someone who had a fairly sizable influence on me in terms of my singing and my artistry as a singer songwriter, really inspiring to me. And also affected me in another way, because of course, as you guys know, my kind of proper job, <laughs> as it were, is as a psychotherapist. So let's go back to the beginning a little bit here. In the documentary, I really kind of appreciated the kind of fly on the wall aspect we had with it. And by the way, guys, as I said, that time sensitivity means that uh, as of the 10th, I think the deadline to watch it on Netflix, I don't know why they've started doing this, but I guess there's going to be some good reasons. 10th of September 2022 is, is how long they're having that available to view. And obviously, I highly recommend it. But obviously, keep in mind those trigger warnings that I've, I've just offered. They look at her kind of life cycle, which, as I say, was just horribly short to my mind. She died in her 20s. There's so much I could say about this documentary. But if you are a fan of Amy Winehouse, as I am, a lot of the story will be known to you. What makes it special, this documentary, is that her best friends and her father, to some extent, her husband, uh, who became kind of ex-husband even in the course of her short life, but they were married. His name was Blake. They all give their accounts. They all share, you know, some intimate insights into their experience, their life with, with Amy Winehouse from their perspective. So it's fascinating. And we don't get to see the narrator's faces very much. Generally, it's spoken over footage of her life. And overall, the documentary, in my view, was very sensitively put together and profoundly moving, really. I, I find myself days later still thinking about it, though, as I say, I knew a lot about her life. You know, I still lived in London myself when she was rising, her star was in the ascendant. Her journey to kind of stratospheric success in my view I mean she again to my mind I wouldn't have said she was kind of Beyonce level famous or successful but really she she got to the height that a lot of artists and musicians would dream of you know and it was a slow journey really because she started so young the things that were striking as I say there's so much about her her life that's known in the wider world but the things that I feel are less well known are the more as is the case in everyone's life really you could argue are the more kind of nuanced aspects 
kids. So for me, watching with my psychotherapist hat on, I really was struck by how candid her parents were in sharing their recollections from her youth and really some pivotal points in her life that became, I mean, I want to be careful here and I want to be sensitive about this, but I don't know, it'll be interesting, you guys, if you go ahead and watch it and then, you know, come back and comment if you want to on this, because I do think it's fascinating, very much in keeping with the corridor or the conversation we had recently around these themes of how the things that happen to us when we're little, the relationships and the nature of the relationships we have with our families, with our Fano when we're young, how they shape us so much. And specifically, some of those pivotal moments. So, for example, in Amy's life, one of the moments that her parents, you know, highlighted, the moment at which actually she disclosed having an eating disorder. And for whatever reason, and I, I think from the way the story was told, I'm thinking it was based on ignorance. No action was taken. And that was a pivotal moment, you know. So for me, kind of analysing it from my psychoanalytic perspective, I would say, I would argue strongly that that was a hugely pivotal moment. But even going earlier than that, her mother was, was again very candid in saying that she found Amy impossible to kind of, uh, kind of rein in or to set boundaries for, that she, she was too soft. And it, in fact, the child Amy Winehouse said to her mum, this is according to her mother at one point, oh, mum, you're so soft. And so, you know, the mother painted Amy as a very headstrong little child who was difficult to kind of tell what to do and, and guide, etc. But again, a pivotal moment. That in itself could be unpacked in an hours long episode of Green Tea Insanity, my loves. And, you know, I don't know how much appetite there is really for the work that I do in terms of the intricacy of understanding the psychology of children and, and how crucial it is that, you know, children require these, this kind of paradoxical mix of freedom and safety and boundaries and limits. And, you know, when we think about discipline, some of us grew up in an age where hitting children was deemed okay. And that's not what I mean when I talk about discipline. If you ever hear me talk about that, really, we're talking about the parameters that keep us safe. And that goes for us as adults. And again, you know, we can look at our society now and observe how that same theme in a way that the mother started by saying, you know, she was unable to say no to Amy. That really, that theme kind of continued through her life, her inability, her difficulty around setting limits for herself, always looking to others to do that for her. And certainly, I don't know about you, but I mean, I see that it's rife in our in our culture as well, where it's just more, more, more. And there's no sense of how do I actually stop? How do I actually reflect? How do I actually slow down? How do I actually sit with myself and my feelings rather than, you know, this idea of being a human doing rather than a human being? I mean, some of these themes are kind of ubiquitous in our culture. So again, I was really struck by that and the link or potential links to Amy's later addiction. And, you know, addiction is a massively complex subject. In some respects, it would be helpful to have Marky here because Marky, in case you don't know, Marky is my husband. And if you're new around here, by the way, do subscribe. If you're liking this, this energy, this vibe, then let me know, right? Give this a thumbs up. Mark is a specialist in the area of addiction. He spent decades working in this area, right? So Marky is just sort of a super expert in the realms of addiction. I would say that that's not one of my strongest areas of expertise, but certainly these things often intersect and cross over in terms of the work that I do. So although, for example, a lot of my patients will be struggling with personality disorders, right? Addiction often goes hand in hand with other things. We really saw throughout the documentary, you know, Amy's continued struggle with setting limits. So I think for me, as I say, the big kind of shock in a way was how candid her parents were really, I would say, about their shortcomings. In some ways, of course, it was very refreshing 
I think there's a lot of gaslighting, a lot of lying in our culture at the moment around certain areas. So when you hear someone just tell the unvarnished truth, it's, for me anyway, it's very refreshing. And at the same time, I was devastated to hear what they were saying. For example, ignoring young Amy confiding in her mother. And this is the other thing that I found really kind of poignant, that how candid Amy was when she was little. So they obviously had set some of that foundation beautifully, that she felt able to be honest with them. And yet somehow there was an inability to act on what she was sharing that actually potentially could have changed the course of her very life. And then her dad having this affair and it sounds like, again, based on what he said and the way the story was shared in this documentary, that it was a kind of open secret in their family. I don't know for sure. That was just a hunch I got. And one thing that I felt based on my clinical experience is that, you know, and based on just understanding children deeply, is that children often, in my experience, feel this kind of betrayal energy, if you will, for want of a better term. They feel when things aren't right between mum and dad. And and again, this is another reason why sometimes divorce is absolutely the best thing that a couple can do for their family, right? For the health and well-being of, and mental health of their family. But nonetheless, in those years when the dad, by his own admission, was unfaithful, I feel as though, you know, the children in the family would definitely have been picking up on something, And that's actually really, really uh, challenging for a young child to process because the worst thing, and even again, a lot of this stuff, it does extrapolate to adulthood as well. What's the worst thing in the world? It's when you walk into a room, two people are in there and the air is thick with something, isn't it? And you're like, what the hell just happened here? You can feel it, right? We're human. That's That's our kind of gift as human beings. So similarly, in families when there are secrets, And I mean, you know, gosh, I've seen this time and time and time again. And I've worked with, as you guys know, I have worked with offenders. Let's just say that one time. But, uh, you know, the point is there there can be families with lots and lots of secrets. And it's almost just as damaging those secrets as the actual behavior. You know, it can be so catastrophic, that energy. And especially when there's lying around it on top, because then we're starting to, you know, gaslight our loved ones potentially when we're saying, oh, no, no, it's fine. Mum and dad are fine. This is all fine. So then the, the person, the young person will start to question, well, okay, well, if you're telling me it's fine, but I'm feeling it's not, there's this disconnect. There's this dissonance. Something's not right. It must be me because that's what children do, right? They make it about themselves. That's their natural and appropriate tendency to kind of make it about me. I'm the problem. And also then it's a lot easier to deal with, isn't it? If, if I'm the problem, then that, that's in within my realm of influence, potentially, let's put it that way. Whereas if it's my parents that are messed up and they don't know what the effing hell they're doing, then I'm really screwed. So naturally children will always defer to, oh, it must be me, right? Because that's a safer place, as damaging as it is. Personally, as a psychotherapist, I have a lot of sadness and regret that I wasn't available to Amy and that my husband wasn't available to her at that time when she was going through hell in figuring out who she was. No doubt, I'm certain I'd put big money on the fact that she was going through her satin return when she when she died because that is the period in a young person's life that is often the most difficult. And in fact, there's a good chance that I was also going through mine at the same time as Amy was, because I remember when she released Frank, the album Frank, which is a fantastic album. I mean, really all her work is just stellar. I think actually her later work was less impactful than for example, the album Frank and Back to Black as well. But all of her work really stands for itself and will stand the test of time in my view anyway but I think that's something that I always sort of it's kind of one of those irrational thoughts really you sort of think I wonder what would have happened if she had been my patient if if she had had myself and Mark to support her I mean she did have eventually she did have I think it was a psychiatrist there was a doctor at one point who spoke in the documentary I've, I've seen in written form actually the words of this physician before it's just so poignant to me all of those sort of synchronicities coincidences and the issue of timing 
One of the things that I found really striking about that documentary was, and again, super poignant, that just all of it was just kind of quite painful in, in many respects, just because, well, for me anyway, as a psychotherapist, as I say, you know, just that suffering, that's precisely why we do what we do is to mitigate some of that human anguish, that mental distress, right? That's, that's why I do this work that I'm so profoundly blessed to do and blessed to be gifted at. Just watching that unravelling was, was very painful. But she said at one point, in fact, no, Amy didn't say it, it was reported speech again from one of her close confidants. I think a friend or maybe one of her producers said she'd confided in them and said, if I could take it all back, this was when she absolutely reached her peak. You know, she could not go out anymore. She had security. She had an entourage. She had the work. She, she'd become a superstar at this point. And it was just so overwhelming for her. And in fact, there were many times, and she had this uncanny wisdom for such a young person. She would say things, they would quote words that she said or on film that gave a kind of intimation of where her life might take her. So, for example, she said, you know, if I got really famous, this was before she was famous, she said, if I did get ever get really famous, I would go mad, you know, that's what she said. And then later she said, you know, if I could take it all back, that very success that so many people, so many young people especially, desperately crave fame, you know, they think that's the be all and end all of life. She said, if I could take it all back just to be able to walk down the street with no hassle, I would. And there was just something about the timing of hearing those words in the documentary that was so powerful to me and so poignant and sad, really. There's so much more I could share, my loves, but really, again, I just want to encourage you, if you are interested in people <laughs> as I am, <laughs> then I really encourage you to watch the documentary. It paints a really fascinating picture of obviously a troubled soul, but also an incredibly, incredibly talented artist. And I hope that's how she's remembered in the main. Just in case, by the way, there's anyone out there who Googles what's a Saturn return. You know, if you want me to do a video on that, guys, I will. I'm a, I'm a student of Vedic astrology. It's one of those areas, one of those subjects that's so infinite. It's like God itself. You know, it's just endless. So I will never really call myself an astrologer, no matter how much training I do, no matter how much I learn, because it's just endless and endless. And there is such amazing teachers out there that I, I, yeah, I just feel uncomfortable about that. I will always call myself a student. But then again, I do with yoga also. I'm a yoga teacher. What I wanted to say is just in case anyone out there is in their late, late 20s, roughly, it, it varies depending on your birth chart. But if you're going through hell, as Churchill said, keep going, right? Keep the hell going. <laughs> Don't stop, right? And just know that the beauty is often on the other side of that hell that you, you know, you might be finding yourself going through. And really, in a way, that's what where I want to end my loves, because there is hope, you know, as a psychotherapist, I can tell you hand on heart, that if you or one of your loved ones has struggled with addiction or is struggling, there is help out there, there is hope and there is a chance at recovery if that person can get into some kind of program. Nothing happens in this world without effort and that is the, the part that often we stumble on. We stumble because we haven't got the patience. I mean, that song, you know, Rehab, that Amy Winehouse wrote, you know, her dad was, was the one in the, another crucial moment in her life where he was called upon to, to be the dad, you know, even though she was a, a grown person by then, but nonetheless, the way her life had unfolded, he had a huge influence and, and remained incredibly influential throughout her life. And somebody said, look, can you please tell her that she needs to get help and he talked to her, they, they had a conversation. He said, oh, she doesn't need to go to rehab. She's got work to do. She's got a show to do. So again, we could kind of dissect all of that. And as I say, him and the mother were not shy in sharing their, their challenges as parents. And I, whether that was done without conscious awareness or not, I, I don't know. But it was so striking and horrifying to me, really, that in that crucial moment, again, 
he chose to say, for whatever reason, you know, I won't say the word narcissist, (laughs) but you know, the thing is, there are those crucial moments and we cannot control ultimately, especially once we're adult, that it's too late. You know, if you want to have influence over your kids and you wait until they're adults to try and do that, good luck, right? Which is again, sometimes why I make this content in the hope that for people maybe who have got younger children, there's still a window, there's still a chance for anyone who's out there despairing about, will I ever get better? Will I ever kick this addiction? Will I ever sort out my mental health? Yes, you can with a lot of work, right? And there are people out there who can help you if you're willing to make that commitment for yourself and willing to invest the time it takes. And this is where, again, as I say, especially now, people fall down because they they don't have a sense of being able to sustain and delay gratification and sustain a process. But it's possible, right? And obviously, that's what I do. My practice is online, right? Same with Mark, right? We have, we have retract. Retract isn't just for those struggling with retroactive jealousy. It's a practice that covers all, so many areas, so many specialist areas. We have a fantastic team. So of course you can reach out to us if you, if you so wish. We're busy. As I often say, I want, want to be clear that I can't guarantee who you might be able to see in the team. But certainly, you know, inquiries are, are most welcome if, if that is what you want to do. But really, in your own area, you know, there will be support. And also, if money is an issue, remember there are 12-step groups available, guys. This, is, this was mentioned and touched upon in the documentary, but not really enough in some ways. Where's the hope? The hope is that there is such a thing as 12 Steps Anonymous, right? Again, if you're struggling with an addiction of some kind or some difficulty in your relationships and your mental health, consider them. You know, there are even online versions for those of us who might not want to go and do an in-person thing or don't feel that's appropriate. There are online meetings as well, but certainly this is a worldwide phenomenon, 12 step group. So again, you can Google that for yourself if you so wish. So just remember my loves, there is hope and there is healing out there if you are willing to put in the work. On that note, my loves, thank you so much for listening. Remember to like, subscribe, leave me a comment. I'm going to leave the comments open for this one. Let's obviously be respectful and kind in what we're, what we're exploring in the comments, but I look forward to that conversation, continuing the conversation with you guys as always. All right, my dear ones, again, thank you for being here. It's always an honor and I will see you in the next one. Kia ora. Mm-hmm.